Paul is there in Athens. He's looking at the Athenians and all their idols that they serve, all their idols. Here we are back to turning from idols to serve the living God. And he's basically saying, look, you need to understand, God freely created the world in order to give us life and breath and all things. He's not served by human hands. He doesn't need us to build a temple for him as though he's sitting around saying, oh, I need this, I need this. I better create these human beings so they can build a temple for me and then I'll have what I need. He says, no, God gives to us all things, everything that we need. Hello and welcome to a slightly less holy than thou episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken and Kenny. I'm Matt Swaim, director of outreach for the Coming Home Network. I'm along with my colleague Kenny Burchard. He's director of development. Uh, Ken Hensley is director of pastoral care. Uh, those two guys were Protestant pastors. I worked at Christian bookstores and played in Christian punk rock bands, but uh, somehow we all ended up Catholic, and that's the purpose of this whole series that we do called On the Journey is to try and justify ourselves to you. <laughs> somehow mm -hmm. please do come visit us at chnetwork.org uh you can find all kinds of resources including previous uh episodes of on the journey you can also go to our online community which is uh community.chnetwork.org if you want to plug into a whole bunch of people who are discussing these questions amongst themselves and again if you want to support what we're doing and uh especially if you want to get a copy of a book uh, by marcus grody called what must i do to be saved um, which we're offering specifically to people uh, who support this episode. Kenny, if you could let them know where they can go so they can get that uh, monthly donation in and get that particular book. Great. Yes. Everyone who wants to be uh, uh, part of supporting what we do and receive the book you talked about, Matt, can go to chnetwork.org slash compass. And for anyone who signs up for uh, compass at any level we'll send them the book as long as they enter the code otj3141 uh, when they sign up all right sounds, sounds good. good so just to <laughs> set the stage uh you know we've been talking about the goal of sanctification and our ultimate union with god and kenny and i were wesleyan arminian in our orientations i was a free methodist nazarene kenny was foursquare pentecostal that kind of world Ken was a Calvinist. I want to say unreformed, but he was actually very reformed <laughs> in his perspective on this. So when we get into what we're doing today, uh, it's going to be a lot of stuff that some Christians, this is like really basic for them. Some Christians, this is like kind of hard for them. So Ken Hensley, how are we starting things off this week? Well, um, <laughs> I've got in my mind a proverb that says, where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. And I kind of feel bad. Yeah, I've just are, transgressed all over the place. Because there are many words here today. Um, yeah, we're talking about sanctification. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, very famous or infamous verse, depending on your perspective, strive for peace with all men, the author of Hebrews says, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Um, we're in the midst of a series that we've begun on the doctrine of sanctification. The questions that we will be addressing, that we are addressing in this series, are questions like, how do we become holy? How does real um, inward change take place within us? What's the process? What's the path? But what we're doing now is we're building some, uh, some theological foundation for that. Last week, we focused on the call of the gospel, but understood in a particular way, understood as a turning from idols to serve the living God, borrowing the language from St. Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. Let me recap, if I can, quickly. As Blaise Pascal taught us last week, every person seeks happiness. Every one of us seeks happiness in everything that we do. It's just simply a fact of life. He points out that even the man who hangs himself is seeking happiness. Okay, well, in our search for happiness, it turns out every one of us is always living by faith. That is, we're always trusting in something. We're always trusting in something or someone, whether it be money or you know, romance, sex, the things that can be purchased, um, prestige, power. In our search for happiness, we're always trusting in something 
for that future happiness. We're always walking by faith. And whatever we are trusting, it turns out, this is what we follow in life. This is what we believe in, if you will. This is what we obey. This is what we love. This is what we proclaim by our life as well as by our words. So when Jesus calls us, this is what we were into last week. When Jesus calls us to come to him, uh, to believe in him, to follow him, to love him, what he's calling us to do is to turn from whatever it is that we have been trusting or that we're tempted to trust for our future happiness, that's repentance, and put our trust in him, to believe in him. This is all contained in the idea of come to me, believe in me. And I want to point out um, as we launch this morning that notice that the thinking that the thinking of the call of Christ in this way, notice how it illuminates the meaning of faith uh, beautifully, really. Um, because when you think about it, what does it mean to believe in Christ? S- some people would think it simply means, uh, you know, okay, uh, a preacher is telling me this story. Jesus was born, he lived, he died, he rose again from the dead. And if I mentally assent to that story and I say I believe it, then I'm a Christian. Well, it, it means much more than that. It includes, of course, believing everything that's been revealed about Christ. But the call to believe means more than that. It means to place our trust for, for our future happiness, as we all are seeking happiness. It means to place our trust in him and therefore to be followers of him, to love him, to obey him, to make Jesus, if you will, and all that is promised in him, to make him the treasure of our lives so that where our treasure is, there will our heart be. And I just want to comment that this is confirmed by the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which describes faith in this way. By faith, man completely submits his intellect and his will to God. It's the whole thing. With his whole being, man assents, man gives his assent to God, the revealer. Sacred scripture calls the human response to God, the author of Revelation. Scripture calls it the obedience of faith. And just just one more quickly. I love the description that Joseph Ratzinger, of course the late Pope Benedict XVI, gave to faith in his work of the introduction to Christianity. This is what he said. The phrase, I believe, could here be literally translated, I hand myself over to. Mm -hmm. To believe is to hand yourself over. It's the whole thing is what I'm saying. This is what it means to believe in Christ. This is textbook Christianity for so many people. Um, And actually what would be kind of surprising to some people is to hear Catholics talk this way, right? (laughs) Because some people who are not familiar with how Catholics approach this kind of thing uh, would perhaps think that what you're about to launch into is like, how do you become Catholic while well, you uh, perform X, Y, and Z task, <laughs> right? And that's not at all how 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 this launches out. I mean, this is very much um, its relationship, its obedience, its loyalty, its fealty, its uh, handing yourself over to Christ. I mean, this is language that pretty much every Christian can agree with. It'd be hard for any Christian to look at this and say, well, at least you would have to look at this as a Christian and say, at least this part of Catholicism is Christian. Uh, at least I would have had to do so in my previous life uh, as a Protestant Christian in my particular tradition. Yeah, and I I would add to that, you know, I really love this language, Ken, that you ended with, with the Ratzinger quote, uh, uh, I literally, I hand myself over to, and just a couple of thoughts here. One, it reminds me of a story I heard as a very young Christian about a Bible translator in a village somewhere, and he's trying to reconstruct the language and translate it into you know, the language of the people, and he comes to this word faith, and they don't have a word for it that seems intuitive to him. And one of the men in the village comes into his room while he's translating, and he's really tired, and he throws himself down on a chair, and he says, I'm so tired, I just want to rest the whole weight of my body on this chair. And the translator looks and says, what What did you just say? I want to rest the whole weight of my body on this chair? Yes, yes. How do you say that in your language? Because that's the word I'm looking for, to rest the whole weight, you know, my whole weight upon upon Jesus. And so that's the word they came up with for what faith really means and what it implies biblically. And another thought is it's so interesting to me when I think about my own, for instance, my seminary education, 
um, where we were all, uh, we students were all reading about what was understood to be the new perspective on Paul by s- folks like N.T. Wright, uh, Matthew Bates, um, Scott McKnight were, were some of the authors that we were reading. It's like a new, a new perspective on Paul is that he really meant that salvation means fealty to Jesus and obedience to Jesus. And now, you know, as a Catholic, I think, well, that's the Catholic perspective on Paul. It's not new at all. And what's happening there, you know, in that discussion is that historical theology is being done and we're recapturing the ecclesial memory that the Catholic Church has retained all these years. Yes, yes. Okay, so the call of Christ then is this total call, you know, to, to, Mm -hmm. to place all your weight upon him in this search for happiness that every one of us is engaged in. The call is turn away from whatever it is that you've been trusting. You're always trusting in something. Turn away from that and put your trust in Christ. Hand yourself over to him. Okay. Now in this episode, we want to move forward a step. We want to fill out the meaning of sanctification a bit more by focusing on God's goal for our sanctification. Okay, what is God's goal for our sanctification? What is God doing in this whole process by which we are becoming holy? And to answer that question, I want to back up one step and ask a more foundational question. Well, what was God's purpose in bringing you and I into existence to begin with? What is God's purpose in creation, or what was God's purpose? After all, we know one thing. We know that God doesn't need anything. Psalm 90 verse 3 tells us, Before the mountains were born, or you, God, brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God existed. We all, we all believe this as Christians. God existed from all eternity in perfect happiness and fellowship and love within the fellowship of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God didn't create, in other words, in order to get something that he lacked, something he needed, something that we could supply him with. And in Acts chapter 17, uh, St. Paul's preaching to the city of Athens, and he points us out to his hearers. Listen to what Paul said. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. That's Acts 17, verses 24 through 25. Now, in these words, Paul is making an allusion to an Old Testament passage from Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2, where we read, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house which you could build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hands have made, so all these things are mine, says the Lord. But this is the man to whom I will look, he that is humble and contrite in spirit, and who trembles at my word. So, you know, in short, Paul is there in Athens. He's looking at the Athenians and all their idols that they serve, all their idols. Here we are back to turning from idols to serve the living God. And he's basically saying, look, you need to understand, God freely created the world in order to give us life and breath and all things. He's not served by human hands. He doesn't need us to build a temple for him as though he's sitting around saying, oh, I need this, I need this. I better create these human beings so they can build a temple for me and then I'll have what I need. He says, no, God gives to us all things, everything that we need. Kenny, I know you want to throw in something here. Go ahead. Well, I think just going back to what you you mentioned just a little bit beforehand, uh, Ken, about the Trinity. This is This is where... Our Trinitarian theology is essential to what you're talking about here. Uh, God is perfect within himself. In other words, he doesn't need anything outside of himself to fully express who he is. He expresses himself within his own nature as the eternal Father, the eternal Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit, the eternal God. And... Um, And so God's not creating because he feels some deficiency that he needs to fill up within himself. Uh, God is internally, eternally perfect. And, and so, so this is important to us when we think, as you said, about our own creation. Uh, God is creating a family because he wants to. He's doing what he's doing 
because he wants to do it. And in fact, this is what the catechism teaches is a couple of lines here. Um, chapter uh, or paragraph 295, it says, we believe that God created the world according to his wisdom. It is not the product of any necessity whatsoever, nor of blind fate or chance. And then in the next paragraph, it begins, we believe that God needs no pre-existing thing or any help in order to create, nor is creation any sort of necessary emanation. Like it just couldn't help itself, but, but to, mm -hmm. to, to just come out of God. No, God decided to create us freely of his own will without any necessity. He's already perfect within himself. Just, just one more thought to wrap this up. This is how God is the eternal Father and Jesus is the eternal Son. The, the love, the fatherhood, the sonship is eternally, um, if you can say, in eternity past, God is a full, perfect communion of persons within himself. Yeah, God's not some element in an ecosystem. God's not like an apple tree that relies right. on the nutrients that come through his roots and cannot help but produce blossoms that sometimes produce apples, <laughs> right? right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And God in is, that sense, creation is not, not dependent an on anything, and he's not. Yeah, he's not. He's not dependent on anything for resources. He doesn't owe anything any resources. He's not part of an ecosystem. He's not yeah. even an apex predator. He's so far beyond that, it's impossible for us to conceive. I want to emphasize here, too, before we move on, that this includes the idea that God did not have to create in order to express his love. Right. Because this, because this is expressed for from all eternity within the fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this presents a problem. Now, we won't go into this in depth, but this presents a problem for religions that have a unitary view of God, like Judaism and Islam. Because if God is a singular, a singularity, if you will, rather than a trinity, then you would say uh, he would not be able to express love apart from creating. He, he would be right. required to create in order to express love. But we won't go down that road too far. I just want to mention that, that, that within the trinity, God is self-contained, self-sufficient, needs nothing. So, why in the world did God create the world? <laughs> Why in the world? <laughs> Given that, well, as we said, it's a free act. It's not a necessary act. Why did he do it? I believe that Paul gives us the answer here in the words, in his words to the Athenians, especially when he says, the God who made the world gives to all men life and breath and everything. He doesn't need anything. Rather, he's the one who gives to all men life, breath, and everything. It appears that, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in, maybe in kind of a strange way, but it appears that rather than God making us a means to his end, that we are pawns in some game that God is playing, in a way, it was God's desire to make himself a means to our end, in, in the sense that his desire was to spill over and share with us all that he has, the fellowship of the Holy Trinity from all eternity, happiness, perfect love and happiness from all eternity, to share that with us, life and breath and everything. It, essentially, it appears, God created us in order to share himself with us, in order to share his own life with us, his own happiness with us. Everything that he possesses within the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and had, had possessed from all eternity, God's desire in creation was to have that spill over for us. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to read a quotation here because Protestant theologian Karl Barth once put it like this, God has no need of creation. He might well have been satisfied with the inner glory of his threefold being. The fact that he is not satisfied, but that his inner glory overflows and becomes outward. The fact that he wills creation is grace, sovereign grace, a condescension, inconceivably tender. You know, Ken, this this idea reminds me of something from my own life, however a perfect and imperfect illustration this is. You know, my wife and I were not able to have children, never have been able to have children of our own biologically. And at about the 13-year mark of our now 30-year marriage, I was alone at home. I was in my kitchen 
my wife was somewhere else, and I was kind of ranting in prayer around my house, and I was saying, I have so much, Lord. I have a home. I have love. I have resources. I've got a room. I've got, I I have so much. Why don't I have children of my own? I have so much within myself to give. And the idea, I guess, that I'm trying to express there to try to connect to what you just said is, you know, God wants to share himself with us. And I, and, and in some little tiny way, you know, in my own life, I can relate to having that sort of sense of fullness and, and resource and wanting to just give it to someone else. Not that it was necessary, yeah. but just, just this overflow that you talk about. This is a thing where you and I have a lot in common because, you know, I'm that Catholic dude who goes back to, you know, hang out with all my Protestant family. And they're like, if you're the Catholic and you got one kid, we have the same sort of struggle yeah. and issue in our family, <laughs> you know, over, mm-hmm. you know, all kinds mm-hmm. of um, issues related to exactly what you're talking about. But, you know, I just want to tap into something that um, was a kind of debate, you know, in my college at Asbury, you know, we were we would often talk and, and, and this happens at like every Bible college in the country. And this happens in like forums all over the place. <clears throat> this idea, what is God's most like defining attribute? And, you know, depending on who you talk to, some might say, well, his sovereignty is his most defining attribute. Well, that's only true once he has something to be sovereign over. Right. Or some might say, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, that's that's a big reformed thing, right? God's sovereignty is like a big, it's yes. like a, um, whereas in Wesleyanism, uh, Arminianism, we might say his holiness, his holiness. Well, if holiness means to be set apart, if there's nothing else, then what are you set apart from, right? But right. love, as you were just saying, Ken, love exists if there's a community of persons in the Trinity and the essence of the existence of God, when, when God says through the burning bush to Moses, I am, like, that's true long before God ever created the chain of events that would lead to, lead to Moses, right? So there are some things that are true about God, and I think it's yes. important to think about, like, what's true about God before he creates the world? That, yes. to me, at least, is, is a very fascinating way to start, you know, a lot yes. of conversations. It, well, and the things you mentioned could send me off on so many trails, because I'm thinking, yes, you know, John in First John says, God is love, okay? God is love. God's sovereignty can only be expressed once he has something, as, as you just said, to be sovereign over. Um, even God's wrath or anger can only be expressed once there is a violation, once there is sin. But God's love is something that is expressed from all eternity within the, within the fellowship of the Trinity. And so God's positive desire in this free act of creation is to have that love spill over, as it were. To share it. Is that motivation? I guess put it this way, Kenny, as you're referring to your desire to have children. Um, God didn't have to create, but that doesn't mean God wasn't motivated <laughs> to create. He wanted to share what he had. Okay, let's move forward though. So so how does God, what does God do to accomplish this goal that he has? Well, to begin, he creates a beautiful environment. We call that the Garden Eden, uh, the Garden of Eden a beautiful environment for us to live in, to enjoy. Then he creates creatures, that's you and I, in his own image and likeness. That is creatures capable then of receiving his love, sharing his happiness, sharing it with one another. He creates these beings, male and female, and commands them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the whole earth. And and this image begins to develop of a world in which the glory of God's goodness, happiness, and love is going to fill the earth as the waters fill the seas. In short, God created for our benefit to his glory. Now, we can see this most clearly when we ponder what it means to say we've been made in the image and likeness of God. And here's where we come back to what you were mentioning too, Kenny, a a moment ago. This is something very powerful to me. This is something I didn't see for a long time. I thought of the image and likeness of God in philosophical terms, you know, really, well, this means we're moral creatures, this means we're rational beings, whatnot. Well, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, we read, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness after his image, and he named him Seth. Apparently, then, to be Adam's likeness and image, 
was to be Adam's son. It was to be a child of Adam. And in the same way, then, to be God's image and likeness is to be God's children. When God made us in his image and likeness, he was creating children, sons and daughters. And this is confirmed when we read the genealogy of St. Joseph from Luke chapter 3, which is a, a long list of names from Joseph all the way back. But listen how it ends. So-and-so was, quote, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So, so interesting. Adam is described here as being the son of God. And I, I would say this is also confirmed in Paul's speech to the Athenians, where he went on to say, and I'm quoting, we are God's offspring. He's telling the Athenians, he's basically telling the Athenians, God has made us to be his children. So although this is something beyond our wildest imagination, it's something we can't really even begin to conceive of, creation is about God wanting, taking this family, if you will, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within the Holy Most Blessed Trinity and wanting to expand his family <laughs> to bring in a vast host of sons and daughters in his image and likeness created in such a way that they are capable of understanding, receiving his love, sharing in that happiness, reflect, reflecting his love and happiness to others. I mean, this is the great purpose of creation, and it is quite mind-blowing. In fact, if I understood even a shred of it, I would you wouldn't be able to see me now because I'd probably have fallen down and be laying on my face on the floor. But that's what God had in mind in creation. It is. And, and you, th this image... Um, this even helps us with how God is talking to humans about himself, especially using this father-son language, this familial language. And, you know, just like we said, God didn't have to create the world. We can also say God didn't have to create the world the way in which he did, but he did create it in such a way. And the way that he created it is as a family, a heaven and earth family of you know the, the angels and the saints these are all uh the creation of god and these are spoken of in familial terms and even in the catechism we learn this r really interesting word uh oikonomia uh which in english you can hear the word uh, economy in there and it really means the law of the household the household yes um pattern and, and the, the law of god's house so what god has done in creation is created a family of sons and daughters. And that's, I think, just hugely important, Ken, I'm, and I'm really glad you started here, in terms of how we understand then what is our response to God supposed to be in light of that reality. I think this is also why people who are artistically inclined are kind of more drawn naturally to this kind of theology and this kind mm -hmm. of ecclesiology, because they know what it's like to have something that's just so in them that it's just got to get out and be like gratuitously expressed mm. in like beautiful terms. And well, I mean, even if you're like expressing it badly, you know, like I did for so many years on guitars and basements, you know, and clubs, right? And, and as you did, Ken, as well, like you, there's, there's something in you that has to get out. Like there's a, there's like a, a wellspring of something um, that has been given you and ideas and, and beauty and, and, and concepts, and you just want to express them, right? I mean, and you don't have to. I mean, you can sit at home and just play them and, and never record anything, and most of my stuff never got recorded. But, you know, it's fun to get it out there. This is, and it this sure is, is fun. This is all a part, this is another aspect of what it means to be the image and likeness of God. Exactly. You know, God's desire for, for all that he possesses to spill over into the lives of sons and daughters made in his image. And so... Once we understand, this series is about sanctification, right? Well, once we understand God's purpose in creation, well, it does not take a rocket scientist to figure out what his purpose in redemption and sanctification might be, given that sin and death have since entered in, into the picture. Now, we're going to be coming back to this a number of times, but just let me summarize very quickly at this point. We were created in the image and likeness of God. We were created to be, if you will, mirrors, finite mirrors of God's nature and being. 
sin has come into the world, and I like to say sin has turned us into funhouse mirrors. Have you guys ever been to a carnival? You ever stood in front of a fun, I mean, a funhouse mirror before, Matt? All I know is whenever, whenever I stand one of those, I'm different shapes, but I'm always bald. I don't know become, why. Whatever happens, no matter yeah. how I stand, I end yeah. up bald either way. The thing yeah, is, I mean, funny. I, yeah, go ahead. I grew up in front of those, Ken. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, you grew up in front of a funhouse mirror. That's so interesting. I, just go, go, it sounds grew, like being grew raised up by going wolves to a place where those. No, were, but you know, yeah. you, you get in front of the funhouse mirror. Raised by mirror. extremely reflective wolves. You you stand in front of a funhouse mirror and either you're shrunk down really short and, and you're kind of fat and short or you're stretched out really long. And I like that image because that's sort of like us now. It's not like the image and likeness of God has totally disappeared right. from within us. We still reflect who we are by creation, God's image and likeness. It's just that because of sin, it's all distorted now. It's all degraded it's it's strange. It's twisted out of shape, um, but the image is still there. And so, in sanctification, that is in redemption and in our sanctification. Again, it doesn't take a genius to see what God is doing. What God is doing is He's remolding us back into the perfect image and likeness mm -hmm. in which we were created, and even more. But listen to what He says here in Second Corinthians three eighteen. Second Corinthians three eighteen. Paul says, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. God created us then to be his sons and daughters. God created us to share everything that he possesses, including his own life and his own happiness and the fellowship of the Trinity. In Christ, then, we are being restored to everything lost in Adam and I could say more, although I just won't go into that right now. I just want you to see the picture created in his image and likeness, just distorted by the fall, recreated. And I love that passage from Paul once again. I just have to say it again. He, listen to what he says. We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed, I could say, back into his likeness from one degree right. of glory to another. We're being ch changed back into the likeness of Christ and then 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4 is a wonderful passage, too, where we read, God's divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. He's restoring mm -hmm. within us who we were created to be, everything we were created to be. That's what sanctification is in a nutshell. Uh, right now, just as you share all that, Ken, the the parable of the prodigal son just comes crashing down, you know, on my my head and my heart as I think about the the fact that God has a family, has sons and daughters, and His son. You know, he, sometimes his sons wander away and they do not live and act in the world properly as the way a son ought to. But in coming back to God, God fully restores. Uh, I think about the thing that the things that the father does bring a robe and put him on him, put sandals on his feet, put a signet ring back on his finger, restore him fully back to his full uh, intended place in the family. And um, if we're not, you know, participating in that process, then I, I fail to see like, how, how sanctification even works if we're not cooperating with God in that well, process. The only thing I would add to that is restored. that, so. you know, when I think of total depravity and I think of the ways that I sort of absorbed it sort of piecemeal from the bands I was listening to, a lot of them reformed. Um, a lot of it was like, I'm a piece of garbage, you know, I'm a terrible mm -hmm. person and one day you will make me holy. And I didn't, I don't think I had from, I mean, being a mishmash of Wesleyan listening to reformed bands, I, I don't think I understood probably, yeah. probably like how to, how to process all this. Like, was I born as a piece of garbage or was I born as a good human being made in the image of God with original sin 
meant to be restored. I mean, I think this is a this is a big thing for a lot of Christians mm-hmm. to try and figure out like where do they where do they fit in the whole world um in regard to all that. Yeah. Do I do I view God, do I view God like the father in the prodigal son that you just mentioned Kenny? Is that how I view God is 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 looking out in love and want and waiting for me to come back home, or do I view him as um, you know dangling me like a spider over hell and saying that you know that I am more loathsome to God than the, the than the vilest creature that crawls upon the earth? Yeah, I mean yeah. this all this touches on our entire view of God um, <laughs> by looking at his desires and creation and all that. Let me make this very practical though. So what what does this mean then for you and for me? And I need to quote another verse or two that I, that I just love so much. In, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, we're told that Jesus was, and I'm quoting now, the radiance of God's glory. Here's, here's the image and likeness again, the mirror of God. He's the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's nature. Um, so completely, so entirely did Jesus reflect the image and likeness of his Father that when Philip said to him, you remember it's in John chapter 14, Lord, show us the Father. Um, how did Jesus respond? Have I been so long with you? Mm-hmm. Have I been but so long with you, Philip, and you don't know me? Uh, mm-hmm. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And the, this is the goal of sanctification in our lives. And I think it might be embarrassing for me to make it personal like this, you guys. But really, this is the goal is that one day, I mean, provided that you don't purposely run off and abandon Christ and reject um, the faith of Christ, anyone looking at you, Matt Swaim, Matt Swaim, anyone looking at you is going to be able to say, oh yeah, I know Matt, he's the radiance of God's glory. He's the exact representation of God's nature. Now, mm-hmm. That's a mind blower. And anyone looking at you, Kenny, is going to be able to say something similar. They're going to say, oh, Kenny... Oh yeah, Kenny Burchard, I know him. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. You know, not meaning yeah. that Kenny Burchard has begun, become ontologically God, the creator of the universe, but that in terms of what you are as a mirror, the image and likeness of God, people will be able to say, yeah, he reflects perfectly God's nature. That's Amen. the goal. That's the goal. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul sums up the promise as... Christ in you, the hope of glory, quote unquote. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, Paul writes more fully, he, that is the Father, chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. He destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. All these passages come together to 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 re- re- reveal to us what God's goal is in our sanctification. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing. And you really see this over and over and over in Paul, that his his understanding of what it means to become a Christian is not just some positional thing. It really is transformation back into God's created intentions for humanity in the first place, of course, filled up all the way in Jesus, who is the express image of the invisible God. But then you see like that, that flows into his pastoral mind about what in the world he's involved in. Yes. Getting, yes. you know, get, getting involved with Christians. So then in Galatians, you know, with tears falling out of his eyes, dropping on the page, uh, um, writing with large letters, he says, uh, in, in chapter four, verse 19, then he says, my little children. So I guess they were supposed to call him father. But anyway, my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So he's Paul's whole image of, of pastoral ministry, his whole image of what the church was trying to do by being involved in people's lives is to participate in this <laughs> reforming, this re, this new creation, really, which is the language that, that Paul uses, of our human selves back into the image of God in Christ. And man, that's work, as we're going to see. <laughs> that's work. 
the work. So my only of comment in regard to this is, you know, there's the stuff you plan to say when you read through Kenny's notes or Ken's notes, and then there's the stuff that kind of occurs to you along the way, and I, you know, in some ways, there's like a Eucharistic Eucharistic epiphany that happens in that question of like Philip walking with Jesus and saying, "Lord, show us the Father," um, and Jesus saying. Have I been so long with you, Philip, and you don't know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And like, you know, in that you can sort of see this Catholic understanding of like, well, we receive what appears to be bread and wine. Um, at what point are you going to show us the Jesus part of this? And, you know, the Christ you know, calling us to say, have you been with me so long? And you don't recognize that this is what is happening. But in a sense, like, that's part of what this whole sanctification question is about. It's not about, like, um, one of these days we're going to discover the God that exists. It's more like God has always existed. He is always kind of in front of us. One of these days, our eyes are going to be open to what is already real and in front of us um, in so many ways. Yes, and what he's, and what he's doing in us, what he's doing in us. Okay, so we've, we, we've looked at the call of Christ which is total, it's comprehensive, to turn from the idols that we're trusting for our future happiness and put all our trust in him. We've looked at the goal of sanctification by looking at the goal of creation, and and, and, and the whole picture becomes clear. God wants to remold us in Christ back into the image and likeness, into his image and likeness, such that we reflect perfectly one day the what we were created to be. And as we close off today, in the last few minutes, I want to talk about the issue of motivation here a little bit, because in, in, in the last passage, passage that I read from Ephesians, Paul talks about how he's we are going to be holy and blameless before him, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Okay, all this to the praise of his glorious grace. Now, many listening, at least some listening to me, Talking in this series so far, so much about our search for happiness, trusting in Christ for future happiness and all that, have got to be thinking something along the lines of, why are you talking so much about happiness? Our motivation as Christians should not be our own happiness. And I've heard this a million times, okay? Our motivation in everything that we do as Christians should be the glory of God alone, I don't care anything for what I might receive in the present or even in eternity. All I care about is the glory of God alone. And you'll often hear people say that that our motivation for doing what is correct or what is right moment by moment should be simply that it is right, that it's our duty to do it. We should not have self-interest involved in our motivations whatsoever. And I want to respond to that because I think that's unbiblical, and I think it's not the Christian way of looking at our motivation and to respond to this, I want to ask some rhetorical questions for you all to ponder. And um, if if you want to take these, Matt, Kenny, if you want to take these as non-rhetorical and jump in after each one and say something, you can, okay? But here's my response to this whole way of thinking, a series of questions. First of all, if God doesn't want me to be motivated by desire for my own future happiness, why did the author of Hebrews say in chapter 11, verse 6, whoever draws near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And why did Jesus say in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal. Rather, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. It appears to me that Jesus is commanding us to think about our future happiness. Okay, so is this supposed to be like like layups and, you know, like batting practice? Because you quoted Matthew 6, but I got Matthew 5 right in front of me where Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. He's saying all these things. Right. Um, for theirs. For and theirs. The word, the word that's 
you know, for theirs that is. we use for blessed can also be translatable as happy. Like Jesus is saying that this is like a way of saying, mm -hmm. if you want to be happy, you should do this thing. If you want to be happy, do this thing too. Yes. I mean. Yeah, the Greek word there is makarios, Latin, which can be translated yes. happy, yeah. blessed, happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the Beatitudes are a series of these promises. Well, if why would we care about happy, that if, if all we cared about blessed, was really giving glory this. to God? Well, look. Okay. Well, here's a second way of asking that same question. I'll throw this in and you can continue uh, throwing in your points here. Uh, here's the second uh, question I would ask. If Jesus doesn't want me to be motivated by desire for future happiness, why did he continuously set before us promises of reward? Which is what you just touched on, Matt, in the, uh, looking at the Beatitudes. For instance, Mark 10, 28 through 30, Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters, mothers, fathers, children, or fields for my sake, and for the sake of the gospel, the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold. It, it, it's as though Peter is kind of feeling very pious and humble at that point. He's like, look, Lord, we, I don't care about myself. I've given up everything. And Jesus kind of stops him in his tracks by saying, look, whatever you've given up, you will receive a hundredfold in this age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children, fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Mm -hmm. So again, yeah. why would Jesus make all these promises of reward if he doesn't want us to think about it? I mean, if what he if he wants our attitude to be, oh no, everything I do, I do only for the glory of God. I'm not thinking about my future happiness at all. Another rhetorical question is this. If St. Paul didn't want us to be motivated by future rewards and the desire for our own happiness, why did he motivate himself in such a way? Listen to these passages. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17-19. For this light momentary affliction, he's talking about the sufferings he was enduring. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things which are seen, but to, thing, but to the things that are unseen. For the things which are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul is saying, I'm suffering. We as apostles are suffering. But you know what? We need to keep this clearly in mind that this light momentary affliction that we're going through, it is working, it is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. And then from 2 Timothy, as Paul nears the end of his earthly sojourn, he says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me. <laughs> what are you talking about, Paul? You should care nothing about what's laid up for you. That shouldn't be on your mind at all. You should be doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do, because it's your duty and for the glory of God alone. Paul says, henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so that's another question. Why does Paul motivate himself by rewards? Why does Jesus essentially command us to lay up treasure in heaven for ourselves? Why does he promise rewards again and again and again? Why did Paul allow himself to be motivated by future rewards if God doesn't want us to do that? If this is somehow selfish, if this is not the way we ought to be thinking about our lives? I grabbed yeah, the closest Bible I could find. And I aimed for uh, Second Thessalonians, but in Second Thess Thessalonians two, uh, we're hovering around verses thirteen through fourteen. Uh, we're bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord God from the beginning, chose you for the salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So God wanted you to be sanctified. Uh, he called you this by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, wait, 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 we're obtaining the glory. Of our Lord Jesus Christ? I thought the glory was all supposed to go somewhere else. Therefore, stand... Therefore, I mean, this is and where that, it gets worse. Therefore, oh, stand yeah. fast and hold the traditions which I have taught you, right? Like, <laughs> but like, we're supposed to have like a partaking in that glory? Is it, won't that subtract? Won't that like, 
you know, yes. minus the minus the glory from yes. God. Like, come no. on. Yes. I, I mean, yes, this no. <laughs> again. I, I hate to be like this uh, because yeah. I, I just want to like put it out there that as a Wesleyan Arminian. Like, there was no question to me that like any glory that I got from following God was because of grace that God gave to me. There was no there was no thought that I was stealing glory from God like any more than like when my child does good in a sport that I trained him in I think to myself well I guess it's not about me anymore it's about him I you know what I think I think I showed him how to do that I, <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, Matt, when I when I grabbed my Bible and opened it, magically it fell opened right to the Book of Psalms. I can't rem- imagine why that would happen, other than that Psalms is right in the middle of the Bible. But you know, the Psalter, the Book of Psalms, which is as Pope Benedict calls it, the 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 universal. It's the prayer of the people of God. You know, go going back through the ages. It starts with, "Blessed is the man." <laughs> who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And it talks about all these rewards for the blessed person who does things God's way that he'll experience in the world and then warns, but not so the wicked. They're like the chaff that the wind blows away, etc. Like if that isn't supposed to be part of our motivation, then why does God give us a prayer about that and want us to say these things aloud and, and think about these things. So to your point, yeah, I, Ken, amen. Yeah, I, I guess rather than saying, here are four rhetorical questions I would ask, I guess you get to say, just read the Bible. I mean, you know, read the Bible, <laughs> almost every verse in the Bible. But okay, here, here's my fourth yeah. one though. If God doesn't want us to be motivated by thought of future reward and desire for our own happiness, why do we read approvingly of other saints in scripture who are motivated in this way? And I, I'm thinking here about Hebrews chapter 11, which I won't read these, I'll I'll just kind of paraphrase them, but for instance, in Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10, we hear about Abraham, and this is what we hear, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he was to receive as an inheritance, and it talks about how he went out, he didn't even know where he was going, but he looked for a city whose builder and maker, but he, he, he was called to go out, not Okay, I'm going to go out because God requires it. He demands it. I'm doing it. I don't know why I'm doing it. Only for his glory. No, he was going to receive an inheritance. And then a few verses later, the author of Hebrews refers to Moses. And this is a passage that really caught me at one point. Listen, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Okay, even though he's the son of Pharaoh's daughter, wealthy beyond all belief, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pressures of sin. Why would he do this? He considered abuse suffered for Christ, for the Christ, for the people of God back then. He considered abuse suffered for them greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So in in other words, (laughs) the way the author of Hebrews describes Moses' motivation, I mean, you would think if he really wants to paint Moses as a great saint, he would have said, Moses just left you know, all the riches of Egypt for the glory of God alone. Instead, he says he considered it greater wealth Mm -hmm. to do what he did than all the treasures of Egypt. And he was looking forward to the reward. So so that in a sense, I think about missionaries. Sometimes Christian missionaries can have an attitude of, I am giving up everything, you know, to go. And someone, someone could say, no, 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 wait. You're, you're running a calculation that there is greater wealth to be found in that direction. And if you're smart and you're looking forward to the reward, then you're going to leave the treasures you have here to go and do that. Okay. And as if th- this weren't enough, I give one more example that I, that I won't go deeply in- into because it's such a mysterious well, really. But in chapter 12 of, of Hebrews, the author even describes Jesus in this way when he says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of God. Even Jesus had joy. He he had this joy set before him that motivated him. Go ahead, Kenny. Yeah, and and this is how you hear this Jesus 
which you read about in Hebrews chapter 12, then coming to his church or churches in the book of Revelation. And over and over and over to the seven churches, he says, to him who overcomes, I will give. To him who overcomes, I will give. In other words, you have, you church, my church, you are called to engage in this world in a particular way. If you don't, I'll remove your lampstand from out of its place. Right. But if you do, I will give you. And then to each church, he gives them a reward, a reward for their, for their faithfulness. Yeah. This is, this is soaking through the pages of the Bible. Okay, in a sermon that C.S. Lewis wrote one time, uh, titled The Weight of Glory, um, to get to the heart of this motivation issue and the question that's being raised, uh, C.S. Lewis talked about this feeling that many Christians have that to seek their own happiness, even if they're seeking it in God, is somehow selfish, is somehow wrong, that it's not the correct motivation. Listen to what Lewis said. The New Testament has a lot to say about self-denial, but not about self-denial as an end in itself. We are told to deny ourselves and to take up our crosses in order that we may follow Christ. And nearly every description of what we shall ultimately find if we do, nearly every description contains an appeal to desire. If there lurks in the mind, if there lurks in most modern minds the notion that to desire our own good and to earnestly hope for the enjoyment of it is a bad thing, I submit that this notion has crept in from Kant, from Immanuel Kant, and the Stoics, and has no part of the Christian faith. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward, the staggering nature of the rewards promised us in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Now, doesn't he take that motivation issue and turn it on its head there? It seems like the Lord would view our desires for our own future good too weak, not too strong because of all the promises that he brings. Okay, yeah. and I want to I want to bring in one final thought which Matt kind of touched on in a way a few minutes ago and then you guys can throw in your thoughts as well. Because of course I agree that everything God is doing in us both in creation and in redemption will result in the praise of his glorious grace as Paul says. And that's true. When God creates us to share his happiness with us, it will be to his glory. It, it, it will be to the redound as his glory, happiness, love fills the earth as the waters cover the seas, as scripture says. But here's the question that I ask, and this is sort of my last uh, rhetorical question. What glorifies God more than you and me seeking and finding our deepest happiness in him? I, I remember when my son was very little. His name is Kenny. His name's Kenny because I'm not very creative, okay? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, you know, when it came time, it's like, oh, I can't think of a name. This is calling Kenny. Anyway, when I would come home from work when he was little, you guys, I would pull in and we had parking areas sort of down the street, about five houses down the street. I would pull in and he'd be out front playing. The second he would see me, he would just jump up beaming with joy and he would just run down the street and it, it, just laughing actually as he ran down the street and just jumped up into my arms. Now, Imagine he does this, and imagine I say to him, Kenny, wipe that smile off your face. You should run and jump into your father's arms when he gets home, not because it makes you happy, not because of anything you are gaining for, you know, from, from this. You should do it purely and simply because it's the right thing to do. It's your duty. You should have in your mind the glory of your father <laughs> and nothing more. I mean, try to imagine that, okay? And it's, it, it's all twisted up, and this is why. To glorify me as a father is to make my worth known as a father. That's what it means. To glorify God is to make his worth known. Mm -hmm. It's to magnify his worth in the world. It's to declare to the world his value, his worth. Well, what could make my worth as a father more known 
than to have my son running down the street out of sheer joy, laughing and jumping up into my arms, not because it's some duty or not because he's thinking of how can I glorify, dang, I don't really want to do this, but I need to glorify my father, you know, and so I guess I'll run down the street. You know, what could glorify me more than having him do this? And I, I would submit it's the same with our relationship with God. And to quote a well-known Protestant pastor on this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. True statement and something to ponder. I believe it absolutely to be true. And I think it also hits at something that, you know, sometimes happens in the Christian life, depending on what denomination you're a part of, where um, God wants for you the thing that is maybe going to make you most miserable and your kind of assent to that duty to be miserable for him will somehow make him happy and then therefore he will be glorified and in fact the whole of the christian life is god wants you to be more human than you are right now so however human you are in whatever aspect that you are human and and you hinted on this uh, you know with your experience of being a father and having a son like god wants whatever that is times like a million you know what god wants for us matt you know on that on that note is for us to be fully human and this is the claim that we make you know christological claim about jesus that he's fully human that is he's human in its fullest capacity to be so and so i'll end with two thoughts uh uh, Matt and Ken, one from Scripture and one from the very same sermon uh, that you quoted from C.S. Lewis's The Weight of Glory. But here, uh, using this father uh, language, this household language in First John, it says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know mm-hmm. that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. So somehow John wants us to be motivated by what we are becoming. And it's so much more than, you know, just God's children. It's, it's, it's full participants, full, um, inheritors of God's own nature. And this is something that C.S. Lewis in that very same, um, uh, text, The Weight of Glory, he says this, and this is shocking, really shocking. Uh, but think about it. He says, It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you could talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, would be so strongly tempted, you would be so strongly tempted to worship or else a horror and a corruption which such, such as you now meet, if at all only a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. And there's more that he says there, but this goes back to what Paul says about, I'm working with and for you. I'm laboring so that Jesus might be formed in you because of what you are becoming and will become, uh, you know, in God's oikonomia, God's household, God's plan for this world and for our lives. Amen. Yeah, and this ties us all back to the title of the series, Turning from Idols to Serve the Living God, to what we've learned from Pascal, from the Catechism, from all of these beautiful passages that have been read today and and referred to, is is that the call of Christ for us in sanctification is to fight this fight every day, every moment, to trust that coming to Him is the path not only to what God is calling to uh, us to, not only what God wants for us, but what we want, what, what, what we've wanted our whole lives and what we are really looking forward to. So anyway, beautifully, I don't want to say anything more. I don't have anything else to say other than I, I'm just thinking it must be if C.S. Lewis were able to like be able to be fast forwarded to like the 21st century to hear how many Catholics are like quoting him and be like, man, that's I don't know. It's weird how many Catholics are quoting me on stuff (laughs) but uh if you want to find out more about what we've been talking about here uh find previous episodes of on the journey please go to chnetwork.org 
We would love to connect with you also via our online community, community community.chnetwork.org. It's a free online community, and it's mostly for people who are looking for questions uh, to be answered uh, in regard to whatever they're asking about uh, in connection with the Catholic faith. I know I just I went around about <laughs> a lot of ways to, to try and say that. But you can also support our work, and we really encourage you to do so by going to uh, chnetwork.org slash compass, putting in OTJ3141. And uh, if you do so and make a monthly donation of any amount, you can get a book by Marcus Grodi on this very topic of salvation, sanctification, all that. So, to conclude, I'm Matt Swain. I'm very privileged each week to be joined by my colleagues, Ken Hensley and Kenny Burchard. Gentlemen, thank you so much. We'll talk to you next week. Until then. Yes, you will. See you later. Hopefully. Bye.